Take a look at the PowerPoint and look at what we're going to look, uh, cover now. We're going to talk about neurotransmitters. Brought to you by Curious Brainland. So when you are trying to understand how these neurotransmitters work, there's a whole variety of them. And the short version of it is they allow for the message from one neuron to be passed on to another neuron. And we have different types and we can neuroscience is like constantly revealing more and more about what we know about them and how oh, this electrochemical oh, signal happens. See the electrochemical part is that sodium depolarization and that causes the action potential to be propagated and passed on to another. But then there's also chemical. So how do you, the synapse, and I did an earlier video, and I can put a link to that in the description, on the basic parts of synapse, I talked about neurotransmitters. So with these neurotransmitters, you want to understand how they function and how the message can actually, we can make it very simple and say excitatory or inhibitory, meaning this neurotransmitter says, hey, pass this message on, or it says don't pass that message on, and that's the inhibitory one. So here's an example of some neurotransmitters. And I put them throughout this PowerPoint. I would definitely pause. We're going to probably focus on acetylcholine, and we'll talk about GABA. There's some other ones, dopamine. If you follow the basic structure, here's the molecular structure of the, of the neurotransmitter. Here's the functional class, meaning is it a inhibitory or um, is it inhibitory or is it excitatory? And actually, some do both. And then the target. For example, acetylcholine is going to work for your central nervous or your peripheral nervous system. It's going to be part of the neuromuscular junction, causing um, muscles to contract. Well, GABA does the same thing, but it actually inhibits muscles from contracting. So and we'll look at two examples for those. So let's look at this. This is the standard or pain reflex. You get mm -hmm. a, a nervous stim a stimulus is the pain, and you're going to pass those through on your unipolar neurons to the inner connection. It's going to go up to the ascending track to the brain to say what happened. The descending track is going to help you heal and then you're going to remove those muscles so you don't burn yourself. Now, this is actually just restating something we did before, but now let's bring in excitatory or inhibitory the, um, neurotransmitters and how that actually can cause the action potential to be carried on or prevent it. And why would you want to prevent it? So here's the list again. Let's look at these two graphs. So neurotransmitters can be excitatory or inhibitory. I've said it numerous times. Here's the here's the short version of it. You see EPSP and IPSP. What they stand for are excitatory postsynaptic potential or inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So let's look at excitatory. This is actually the one that we are more familiar with because we've talked about action potentials. We've talked about moving it from one neuron to the next. That's what synapse is. And so th let's just say there's a stimulus. Uh, nicotine. If you Nicotine is going to cause acetylcholine to kick into gear. So that's the stimulus. The action potential is moving down. And watch what happens. So acetylcholine binds to acetylcholine receptors that R stands for receptors. So ACH stands for acetylcholine. It's going to bind to the ACHR, that's the acetylcholine receptor. So this acetylcholine receptor would be in the postsynaptic uh, terminal. The acetylcholine came from the presynaptic terminal. So back to your basic cell one, cell two. So the action potential came down and the neurotransmitter was released from one neuron. It's going to affect the next one. If it if it uh, causes the sodium gant chase channels to open, then the postsynaptic membrane is going to depolarize. That's your action potential. So this is actually how the action potential jumps from one neuron to the other. That's what acetylcholine can do as a response to a stimulus. So let's talk about inhibitory now. Inhibitory, let's, use, let's talk about GABA. Okay, so that's this one right here. And you notice it's listed, uh, its functional group is listed as a, a inhibitory a neurotransmitter. And it will actually, can actually cause a neuromuscular junction to not occur versus the acetylcholine caused it. So how does it actually do that? If you kind of read what I've had posted here, and look at the graphs. See, this causes the standard re go over threshold, depolariza depolarization, and if there's enough stimulus, it will run up and do our standard curve that we've seen before. 
hyperpolarization is something that we don't want to happen, but GABA does this. So, so let's say this case, the stimulus is alcohol. Alcohol is going to stimulate GABA to bind to the GABA receptors, but instead of, and it causes the potassium gates to open. Well, a neuro, um, an action potential usually has the sodium gates to open first. So if potassium opens, it's going to diffuse out. You're losing positive ions. That's going to further cause hyperpolarization. That's going to stop an action potential. Take a quick look at this. This is basically a summary of the drawing. So a positive video, it restates the excitatory, causing the potential to be reached when you go past threshold. And then, so there's your 70 millivolts and the action potential continues. Well, for GABA, what it does, and actually serotonin is another one it does, they trigger hyperpolarization. So instead of doing this, going up, it goes like this, down. And that's going to inhibit the response. It will never reach threshold and it actually pushes it farther away from threshold. Here's just a visual of the inhibitory response. Watch, this is another one. This isn't GABA or serotonin, but what this does is Look at the volume of neurotransmitters that normally would happen. So here's the presynaptic. There's your one. There's your two. All right. And these are the vesicles, the synaptic vesicles. So they normally dump their contents into the synaptic cleft, causing depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. Well, the inhibitory one, what it does is it releases its neurotransmitters that prevent these neurotransmitters, the volume, to reach the postsynaptic one. So this is an, actually an another means of inhibition, which is you you stop the action potential from occurring at a fast enough rate or a large enough action potential to actually depolarize the postsynaptic membrane. So that's two examples. Let's talk about a couple other things. So here's some other examples. Just pause the video if you need to. Uh, norepinephrine is another one. Um, dopamine, which we talked about, GABA and serotonin. Um, Actually, gases, um, nitric oxide, can be a neurotransmitter. So, did, so can carbon monoxide. All right. To change gears a little, let's talk about communications and the strength of the of the neurons uh, interacting with others. This is what we call pathways. We saw, we call it your neural pathways. So sometimes divergence was would be one neuron that in turn its axons affect this one, the action potential, follow the arrow. The arrow is the action potential being propagated and passed on as a synapse. So this branches out and this branches out. That's called divergence. Convergence is several different neurons affecting one neuron. And that's like the strength. This is like when you have the increased strength, the neural pathways are all targeting this one, which is going to send a message down to a whole bunch of more um, neurons. So that's divergence and convergence. and some just some housekeeping let's talk about this is lower tier importance but understanding how the postsynaptic potentials can actually affect neuron activity so each one of these e stands for it excitatory the i stands for inhibitory so a typical neuron can re receive excitatory or inhibitory so here's the dendrites and so sometimes all right so look at it. it says threshold the no summation doesn't nothing happens uh, then temporal, spatial, so I have a picture for each one of these. So if the resting potential is reached, there's a stimulus, but it's not enough to cause it to go past threshold. That action potential doesn't cause a propagation and a, a later synapse. So actually I have summation here. Summation is basically saying if I add this action potential and this action potential, they're going to be great enough to cause it to propagate. And that's summation. Another, temporal is when it is basically where the synapse is going to be. It's going to. It's one action potential, but it's a very high frequency, and it's going to cause the action potential to go on. For I recommend pausing the video and just looking at the written descriptions for these. And I have this PowerPoint on Blackboard. And then there's sometimes you have a combination of excitatory and say you have the summation that um, there's like two or three cause it to override. So see these two, they override the inhi inhibitory, or maybe the inhibitory overrides the excitatory ones. And so this is a combination of your EPSP and your IPSP. Lastly, let's talk about diseases. So you saw the inhibitory one from up here. 
how that actually prevents the action potential from continuing. There's a variety of options that can happen. Some diseases are basically, they alter the synapse. So look at this, there's acetic OH, there's the, this is the normal one, and what happens is sometimes you have a disease where you have antibodies that actually block, these are, they're actually blocking the sodium gates. So this prevents not the secretory vessels or the synaptic vesicles from releasing ACH, it's preventing the ACH from binding to the receptor. And if you don't bind to this receptor and you don't bind to the sodium gate, sodium doesn't get to doesn't pass through. So it basically prevents the sodium gates from opening. The voltage gates doesn't open. Action depolarization doesn't occur. Um, here's some other examples. Uh, how basically medicine? A lot of times medicine like will actually stop the gate, the channels. It will stop the synapse from in like your pain receptors. You no longer need to fire that many things. You've had pain, so they slow down. They stop. They're inhibited. And sometimes, like say, for example, in this case, serotonin will uh, will, will slow those synapses. Um, and there's increased levels. So I'm gonna. There's so many varieties, and I need to kind of sum up what's going on here. The whole purpose of, say, what drugs do is they either enhance the synapse or they inhibit. So they're ba it's back to the excitatory, the inhibitory. Sometimes they cause the neurotransmitters to not be released. Sometimes they cause more to release. And there's a there's some other animations I'll show in class that review this. So, uh, for example, here's uh, barbiturates. And what they they alter the activity. Now the thing about uh, drugs is they sometimes they require more and more and more neurotransmitters to be released. This is why people talk about building drug tolerance, which is is it took a certain stimulus to cause the action potential and the synapse to happen. Well, the person that takes the drug that causes it that requ they require more of the drug to substitute as that neurotransmitter, and it and so it requires more and more and more of that drug uh, to actually have the same effect. All right, um, here's one last example, um, failed glutamate transporter. All right, so this is, I haven't gone into all the different neurotransmitters, but if you look at what glutamate does is uh, it basically causes overstimulation of the postsynaptic one. So those are the kind of varieties of examples of when it's not functioning properly. We look at, at normal functioning, excitatory, inhibitory, disease, drugs, poisons, they, they offset that and affect your neural balance. So, all right, thanks for watching.